Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am Linda Selman, chair of the theater committee here at the National Arts Club. On behalf of my co-chair, Stephen Goldberg, and our theater committee, we'd like to welcome you to a special author's talk this afternoon with the remarkable Margot Jefferson, Pulitzer Prize winning author and New York Times theater critic, as she shares an in-depth conversation with Foster Hirsch, interviewer extraordinaire, film historian, and author on How Miss Jefferson Joins the Materials of Arts Writing, Poem, Song, Performance, with the Material of Life Writing, history, and psychology to create her latest life-changing work, Constructing a Nervous System, a memoir. Following their interview, we will have the proverbial Q&A. So please write down your questions in the chat box and I will return to share them with our guests. And do look out for a link on the chat box as to how to purchase a signed copy of Miss Jefferson's amazing book. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with the National Arts Club, we are a 501c3 nonprofit with a mission to stimulate, foster, and promote public interest in the arts. Annually, the club offers more than 150 free programs to the public, including art exhibitions, lectures, readings, and theater, dance, and musical performances. For additional information, you can always visit us at the nationalartsclub.org or on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. And if you are interested in becoming a member, please send an email to admissions at the nationalartsclub.org. Now, on July 20th at 8 p.m., the Theater Committee's next event is for those of you who love cabaret. K.T. Sullivan and the Mabel Mercer Foundation will present a concert salute to the LGBTQ plus community. We look forward to a fabulous evening of gender bending as we celebrate Pride Month here at the National Arts Club. And now ladies and gentlemen, Miss Margot Jefferson and Mr. Foster Hirsch. Okay, I, are we ready to start? Yes, we are. Okay. Thank okay. you very much, Linda. And hello, Foster. Hi, Marco. Nice to see you. Hi. I want to start by holding up this extraordinary book, Constructing a Nervous System, a memoir, Margot Jefferson. I think, Margo, my first question is, how do you define memoir? Yours is a very different kind of construction. It is not at all a traditional or orthodox memoir. Uh, that is true. Uh, I, the nice thing about the word memoir, even though there are, you know, it has a history, there are a legacy, there are traditional forms, but relative to say autobiography, um, memoir leaves one a lot of room to choose <laughs> and shape and select what, what, you want your memory to settle on what you want it to evoke, what you want it to engage with. It might be, for example, just a, you know, a few years of your life. Um, you know, it might be a relationship like um, you know, with, your, with a parent. Um, so I decided to really take advantage <laughs> of, of that room. Uh, after writing Negro Land, which I actually thought of as a cultural memoir, meaning it was personal, but it also was very much me as a figure um, in a larger 
um, social and and um, historical and and racial and gender um, and complicated and artistic culture. Um, so I would move from since this was the theater committee, maybe being the Greek, the member of the Greek chorus, and then taking the lead. Here, what I wanted to do, since I've spent so many years um, as a critic and had just begun in the last 10 years to write memoir, um, I had to make it a little untraditional because I wanted um, the materials of criticism which we think of as more objective, more formal, more, um, more analytical and scholarly. I wanted them to draw on the intimacy of, of memoir. And that meant, you know, linking them to early memories, to associations, to um, opinions that I couldn't necessarily justify, that were, that, you know, that were irrational. So, and I wanted um, memoir to um, be able to draw on a certain kind of objective inquiry that for, of myself, in fact, as well as my world, that um, criticism can do. You know, you're, you're, look, you're going to, um, well, you, Foster, for example, yeah. you're writing your book on Otto Preminger or, um, you know, or Woody Allen, and you are, you know, you're blending passionate feeling with very rigorous, you know, objective um, thinking. And I wanted to but bring that to the self. That, and that, the that's, you know, that's exactly what you do. You marry memoir with criticism, but you, Margot Jefferson, are the focus of the book, whether you're talking about your life or you're talking about how you're reacting to cultural figures who've had an influence on you. Yeah. You're always at the center. You're I always am. at the center. In that it's way, I guess I want it to be center stage. <laughs> it is time. your sensibility. In fact, your opening scene is Margot in the spotlight performing. Yes, absolutely. And drawing from um, French melodrama. <laughs> you know, yeah. I, have a, I had this strange, uh, you know, obsessive vision. And drawing from Bilbo Jangles Robinson, you know, who calls out, give me a light my color, and then yeah. black out. But, um, but, but that, it's but my that, way of announcing sense. that I'm entering this, this stage of, you know, myself, my life, my, my, my life with art. But it is, it is very much your engagement with figures who are important to you. Yes. Who have had some cultural and, and emotional significance for you, but totally. it's your relationship to them and you, you always introduce first person and third person, you, or, but, but you, you tease us with uh, tidbits of your family. Yes. And in a way, the, the reader almost has to know Negro land mm. in order to fully, fully appreciate this. Is that is that the wrong thing to say? No, I kept no, no, no. <laughs> going back to Negro Land. This is like Negro Land Part Two. And through these two books, I've gotten to know your family as much as you'll allow me to. I, I know about Denise and Irma, and your father's name is Ronald. Ronald, that's exactly right. So I, I, I feel I know all three of them and you. I like them all enormously, okay. and I want to know more about them. But you, you introduce them here in fragments only. No, that um, that is absolutely true. Um, though they are frag, well, I won't say though. Um, they are fragments that I didn't dwell as much on in Negro Land. But nevertheless, you are right. That was the correct thing to say. It's not exactly a sequel, but it's a cousin. It's a descendant. <laughs> in the um, so you know, my father first enters via. Uh, my father um, loved. Um, uh, jazz, um, well, and he loved classical music too. He wanted to have been a trombonist, jazz and classical. But I introduced him and his, his forthrightness and upstandingness as a, as a citizen, as a, as a doctor, as a, as a an admirable, um, dignified man, but also his melancholy, which he suffered from all his life. I really introduced this through listening to a record of the great pop pianist, Bud Powell. And my father 
talking to me about him and my discerning through listening to Powell and mixing that with my father's words, um, you know, worlds of complicated emotion, um, you know, chords of, of melancholy and longing, but also of, of exhilaration. Um, so, yeah, he's, he's my, Bud Powell, an artist is often the, the guide. Um, the, the spotlight shown on a family member and the family member um, is often the, the catalyst, the prompt. The, the family member is the catalyst, but you tell us only so much about your family members. That's, that's true. And that is because of this, this hybrid of, um, of memoir and arts writing. Um, for my purposes here, um, I, um, I wanted to tell the reader as much about, let's say, Josephine Baker or Willa Cather um, or whatever, even the quotes I use, um, you know, from Catherine Mansfield or, um, or uh, I want in, in any case, I won't keep naming, but I wanted to um, the reader to be as intimate with those figures as with my family members. And, and that, in many ways, more, more intimate, I think actually more intimate that actually happens and there's so many figures in the book that some of them you introduced me to some of them i knew already you I'm presented sure. them in new contexts but there's some that i want our listeners and your potential readers to to pay particular attention to and that really fascinated me mm -hmm. there is at the end of the book a and they often appear in in pairs the the, the famous people but at the end of the book, there's a very touching contrast, binary you set up between Josephine Baker, whom of course we all know, but then a woman named Janice Kingslow, whom we don't know. And you, you set up a contrast saying, Josephine Baker was made for victory and Janice was not. That's right. Uh, you know, the maybe the older you get in some ways, the more poignant um, the stories of those people that fate and fame forgot, but who had those gifts, who had the potential. Those stories become extraordinary. Um, you know, we all know Josephine Baker. We all know the triumph that she rested, you know, <laughs> um, across continents, across class and racial boundaries across languages, um, across styles. But um, Janice Kingslow was actually um, a friend of my mother's in Chicago. She was one of many gifted young women who began, um, whatever their race, in local theater. And they work very hard and they work with acting teachers as Janice did. She was um, you know, she was trained. She helped found um, a theater group, you know, um, in Chicago called the W.E.B. Du Bois Players. She was um, leftist. She, like many actresses in the 30s, 40s, she got her first, you know, break by doing a regional production of the then very famous play, um, an all black play, Anna Lucasta, which I know Foster you know, because there are movies of it as well. So she, got, she got to New York and this was, this was the play that, you know, that if you were going to put a black on Broadway, you put, put them in and Anna Lucasta was glamorous, but a little bit, you know, but tormented and a fallen woman who restored herself to goodness. Um, Eartha Kitt played her in the movie. Janice Kingslow had a great success in the 30s in Hollywood. Hollywood came calling, forgive me, the 40s. Um, and they, they offered her a contract with the condition that she agree to pass uh, for, to pretend that she was white and to simply X out you know, <laughs> this, this genuine biography of herself as um, a fair-skinned um, woman of color, Negro, as we would have said in those days. Um, she said no. Um, and she went back to Chicago um, by this, um, and, you know, worked in theater, worked in advertising, but, you know, it's a little, it's a little hard. It was a little catch-can after that 
great opportunity. Then she got in, involved in progressive politics, leftist politics, and in the 50s, the blacklist came along and her work dried up, you know, advertising. Um, she had been working in um, my father's, the hospital that my father um, was a pediatrician at. She lost her job there. Um, you know, the, 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 the long hand, um, as I know you know, Foster, of the blacklist was astonishing. She simply disappeared. No one knew what had happened to her. Um, years later, in the go to the 70s, my mother and her friends are at, one, are at a luncheon, one of their club meeting luncheons, and this ghost-like, um, pale hair pulled back in a very severe bun, wearing you know, perfectly adequate but unglamorous clothes, walked up to this table of very glamorous, um, chic women and about six of them. And she said, you don't remember me, do you? Um, I'm Janice Kingsley. And they were all absolutely stunned because clearly time had dealt harshly yes. with her. And as it turned out, Janice Kingslow had in, um, in, amidst the harassment of the blacklist, despair over this acting career gone kaput, she had had a serious nervous breakdown and been institutionalized for some years. And my mother and her friends, um, with a certain amount of shame and guilt, realized they had completely lost touch with her. Um, I did, you know, went back to old jet magazines and Ebony's and found the article that she wrote um, about having been in the mental institution. Uh, but what broke my heart was um, this, 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 this gift, this beauty. She was absolutely gorgeous. Um, all squandered, gone to waste. And, and, you know, it's my generation and certainly the, the young women, um, especially women of color after me, but, you know, we have, we, 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 we have a lot um, thanks to these older women. And, um, you know, history, history has been in many ways on, this, on my side. It was not on the side of Janice Kingslow. And she, whatever this, whatever that strange alchemy of, of you know, indomitable you know, fierceness, um, one has or doesn't, she did not have that. Josephine Baker could always act on and act out. I'm going to do this. I'm going to fight that. And Janice Kingslow couldn't. And I wanted, but she really, it was, it, yeah, she couldn't. It wasn't a failure. It was just what she couldn't do. It. We all know people like that. We've all been in situations like that. And so I wanted to get, I didn't want this to just be an account of, of triumphs, you know, um, artists. They but, but, but Marco, I, in reading all of your splendid accounts of, of black artists, I, I feel that you discuss the art or the accomplishment in relationship to race. So that if, a black performer is successful or not, it has a larger cultural and racial representation. Is that unfair? No, I think that's absolutely right. You mean the, the story of their life is more the story dependent of their on, life. In other words, on, on racial something. rituals and, and rules and prohibitions. Absolutely, absolutely. If, if and they accomplish something, it's in, it's in racial terms. Let me give you an example. Ah, you mean they are also up. confined to being seen in it, that way. It, so seems, I, it seems so. Historically, I, 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 that's true, yeah. I was right, I'm writing about, uh, in my book on the 50s, I'm, I, I do have a, a section on Sidney Poitier, and I kept referring to him as a black actor. And I, I was getting very uncomfortable because I thought this man is an extraordinary actor. Why does he have to be, is, is what he did for himself or for his race? And can it be a detached from racial, do you follow what I'm saying? I, don't, I do follow what you're saying. It's a, it's, I would, a, it's a touchy subject. It is a touchy subject. I would say for him and as the people I'm writing about, what you do, what is expected of you, what society, your own and the larger white society demands is that you represent your race. 
at the same time, if you are an artist or an individual, you are fighting for this thing called self-expression um, and exploring and representing um, as many aspects of, of your crafted and trained self as possible. I, for Sidney Poitier, I wish he had had more opportunities to play less predictable roles. What I try to do with all the Black artists I write about is put them in that cultural, historical, political, racial context, and also simultaneously show them um, fully at work. Um, and as an artist drawing on, as artists drawing on every possible, you know, influence, um, you know, surprising people with who, you know, who knew that Ella Fitzgerald um, loved Connie Boswell? You know, well, she did. <laughs> no. So I'm, um, one has to do both. Um, as in Negro Land, writing in part about a black history, I moved between the, the, my, my participation in a group history and my development um, and participation in, and sometimes rebellion as, you know, um, rebellion within a very particular history. I, race really intensifies and demands that of us. Um, I think many people, um, particularly, you know, those whose, you know, eth ethnically, um, gender, sexually, have complicated and challenging backgrounds that it doesn't have to be a binary, um, but it's, it's always, you know, it's always, there's always a doubling of questions of responsibilities. Um, there's of, a, of role I like playing. It. There's a doubling of responsibility. A yeah. white artist can be just that person. And Woni doesn't even have to be described as a white artist, right? I mean, you didn't have to say Robert Mitchum, white actor, but you found Luke saying Sidney no. Yes, that's right. No, right. but you do say Sidney Poitier, black movie star. Yep. And now, I, what would I happen like if it. you didn't? That would that would be interesting. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't, I don't, I don't like that. But I think it's a, it's a, it's a racial reality, is it not? I think it is, and I think in in our work, um, because it is something I come up against too. It's worth commenting on. You know, which is exactly what you're doing. You know, if you can't, we can't always vault past um, much as we'd like to the confines or the stereotypes that we've been given. And sometimes they have a certain historical weight that we have to acknowledge, but we can comment on them. We can open them up. We can challenge them. And we, we can, can look at them from readers. a variety. Yeah. We can look at them from a variety of, of perspectives. And ask of our readers to do the same. Yeah. And that's exactly what you do. I was very interested that you have some encounters with white artists in this book oh, as absolutely. well. Bing Crosby, yep. Harriet Beecher Stowe, absolutely. Gone with the Wind, and actually the most moving part of the book for me, I have to say, was your encounter with Willa Cather, well, which you great. develop as a procedural. But at the end of it, you make a connection between you and Willa Cather who had to make all kinds of adjustments herself as a very plain lesbian, exactly. desiring the kind of woman who would not accept her. Exactly. So and, the, and readers who did not want to know that she was, you know, um, oh, that no. she was a lesbian. That's right. And at the end, you're right. I say, all right, Willa Cather, you know, after I've um, in, engaged with her and critiqued her seriously for the ways in which she handles race in a book that is in other ways quite fascinating, but you know, it's a procedural. I had to identify the crimes. Uh, I say at the end, I understand what you had to do. I understand the concession. Because you're doing that throughout because the book. I have had to do the same as a reader of white literature. And, but that's exactly your stance throughout the book. As a very sensitive reader of white literature, you had to make certain adjustments that white audiences and readers don't have to do. Not with white literature. Um, what we'll probably see more writing about, um, or you know, whether it's literature or film or whatever, is the adjustments that white readers have to make 
to black or other kinds of non-white art. You know, I, I, you know, Marco, I think that's happening now with the black plays on Broadway. Mm, where, I think where that's I, right. I think I've been a Margot Jefferson position as a consumer of those plays. I have to make adjustments and transpositions and uh, approach it from a very different way, much less comfortable than I, seeing a white show. Much, yeah, much yeah, yeah, less yeah. comfortable. That makes I that makes perfect sense. I like the word transpositions. Yes, adjustment <laughs> transposition. Yes, and it's a very strange business because when you're very also caught up in a work, there there are whole per periods, um, whether it's on stage or on the page, where you're just here. I am, and then comes that sociological, that racial, that um, that gendered, whoosh, you know, slap yes. in the face. And you pull back and you're confused and you're, you don't trust yourself. You get angry, maybe, you know, all of those things. Yeah. But what, what you do in this book, which is exceptional, is you touch on all the issues of identity politics, which are so important now, but which can become, we can be lectured about it and we can be in the face of people who are very angry about it. Whatever anger or discomfort you have, you do not transfer that to the reader. Mm -hmm. So you allow us to participate in your project without lecturing us white readers and outsiders to your perspective. You don't badger us. And that's, a, that's hard to do mm -hmm. because I, there is some anger, I think, in, in what you've had to the kind of negotiations. Yes, and, 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 yeah, but, you're, and, but you don't write as an angry woman. Well, maybe I, uh, maybe it would, I should say, anger is, first of all, as you know, um, as a man of theater and film, anger has many modes, you know, uh -huh. there can be sardonic anger, there can be enraged anger, there can be playful anger, you know, anger can do play all sorts of parts. So I, I think of anger um, as just one of my tools, you know, and um it, does, it isn't always confrontational, but it's probing. And it's not my only tool. You're absolutely right. I also didn't want, you know, I have, I will have, I have Black readers. I have readers of other, getting past the Black-White binary, readers of all sorts of other groups. I didn't want to presume on them either, you know. Um, just be, you know, we're Black. We share many things. You're, you reader, but black readers, but you are different temperaments than I am. You're different generations. You're different class background. I want to give you room. I want to give you room. And you, and you do that. You do not write from a fixed orthodox position. Your, your writing is a kind of discovery and investigation. And you invite us to participate in Good. that inquiry I and investigation. Yeah. You yeah. pull yeah. us in rather than push us out. And given the touchy subject matter that you're dealing with, that's hard to negotiate. Well, you know, I think you're, that's true. But part of what um, I think, you know, helps polyphony in the book, um, you know, some of it, a good deal of it is, is my, my doing all, everything that I can with the tools of arts writing to make um, the sound of a Bud Powell, um, the, the dances of a Josephine Baker, to make the actual art, um, including, you know, um, Willa Cabas, even when I'm angry at her. I want to give the reader um, excitement and pleasure um, and even some respite, you know, <laughs> yes. through, you know through the experience of the art. You have great descriptive powers. You made me see Bud Powell's artistry. Oh. You made me hear Ella Fitzgerald. Oh, the you, divine one, yes. Yeah. Even yeah. though that's technically Sarah Vaughan, but Ella is divine, yes. Yeah, <laughs> but you, 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 you recreate the artists you, uh, you write about through a wonderful fluidity of language and descriptive power, which I suspect took hours, weeks, months, but you make it seem as if it just rolled off uh, when you sat down in the first draft. I know it didn't. You know it didn't. Don't I wish, <laughs> don't we wish it could when we're laboring? 
no. over those sentences and they those. get ah, right. But you're, you're, you're practically every sentence is the occasion of my admiration and my envy. If only I could do that, if only I could have that kind of descriptive power, but you give me something to, to move toward. Now you did surprise me. You surprised me throughout the book, but I think our, our listeners would be surprised too. But Margot Jefferson is very drawn to and very interested in Ike Turner. <laughs> well, um, <laughs> Margot, Margot has been, as it turns out. Um, you know, I have a section in the front of the book where I talk about being um, a young girl and, and again, you know, entering into this world of, um, of racialized entertainment and, you know, black performers and their charged place in their, in, at, the, at the height of, of black culture, but they're, they're charged place on the margins, but sometimes in the center of white culture. So I talk a little about, you know, these glamorous creatures like uh, Nat King Cole, my parents, um, wonderful generation, and um, Billy Eckstein and uh, Johnny Hartman. And then I move to the, um, the dream boys of, um, of um, rock and roll and soul music, Marvin Gaye, Sly Stone. I envied all these men as men, um, as black men, the power they had to, however fraught, to claim, um, you know, the um, fascination of the culture. And, you know, yes, we had Lena Horne, we had Dorothy Dandridge, but there was a certain male power and privilege that, um, that I wanted. And then I moved to um, a kind of rhythm and blues anti-hero. Um, and as often in our lives, um, as it often happens in our lives, the anti-hero or anti-heroine um, is a figure who's your, who ha holds a certain fascination for you, who seems um, to break rules, to um, claim license that you don't approve of necessarily, you don't admire, but that their, their, their will and a certain charisma um, fascinates you. And I found this, this started um, <laughs> simply when my dominating older sister and I, when we were, you know, playing and singing and dancing and, you know, role, role, role playing um, all the old 45 records, the way we did all the old musical comedies. She said, I'm Tina, you have to be Ike, you know? So, <laughs> So this is what I would do as a little as a little girl, and it weirdly enough stayed with me. I, I thought, um, you know, the way a movie figure does. I thought, well, what has he got that that's that's fascinating? This was, of course, long before we knew that he was um, literally um, a, a violent abuser. What he had, um, which was this ability to stand back, um, the back of the stage. And with just the raise, raising of an eyebrow, stroking um, of a guitar string, turning of his head, um, set the beat, change the beat, um, keep all the women moving and acting. And to have that kind of um, power through stillness and a certain icy coldness, um, I didn't, it was fascinating to me. Yeah, um, I compare but, him, I compare him to, Ms. I quote from Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, where one of the um, uh, figures, one of the London figures trying to diagnose this monster, Mr. Hyde says, you know, is, is he some other species or is it the radiance of a foul soul? Um, we all know in, in um, performance, the fascination of the villain. Now, and but you're, you're you're drawn to the villain. You tell us about in this it, case. So, I was, but it doesn't it doesn't stop you from being drawn to him. I, I feel no. I both denounce him, him and and I try to fully fully document my denunciation and fully document um, my fascination. Um, both, I both. To, yes, both but of them. The, absolutely, Margot. The fascination is stronger than the denunciation. Oh, is it? I thought it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it wasn't. Oh, 
Well, you know, maybe it had to be. Um, when <laughs> Tina Turner's memoir came out, where she told all, um, I reviewed it for the nation. And of course, you know, I am a heartfelt um, feminist. And that's what my review was. So some of that found its way here. But uh, I was not trying to rehabilitate him. But I was no. trying to explore. Yes. You, there's no sense of rehabilitation. In fact, there's, a, there's an interesting absence of real judgment. What you do is you evoke his power and his authority. Dare, dare I even say his masculinity? His uh, No, totally. Totally. That was what initially as a, as a pre-adolescent and a young adolescent fascinated me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, Margot, what I appreciated, you could go to see Gone with the Wind. Your mother went to see it. Denise went to see it. You could recognize all that is wrong, even toxic about it. And you could still say, you know, I liked it and enjoyed it. In those days, I did. And who's, well, you know, in that way, we could, we could say, Gone with the Wind and Ike Turner <laughs> <laughs> all participate in this strange cultural drama um, or culture. Sometimes it's just, it's ridiculous comedy of things that repel us and unsettle us and feel very distant and alienating. And yet, yet we are drawn to, and we want to be part of. The thing about Gone with the Wind that is so terrifying is, um, I think I last saw it about five years ago. Well, you know, I'm not a gullible child anymore, um, but it as, even as you were saying, oh my God, this is repulsive. Even for all, you recognize this machine of melodrama um, is somehow still working. And that is terrifying um, as well as fascinating. But it is also, you know, it's an American, you know, piece of American iconography. I, my parents had to deal with it. I had to deal with it. You know, you must, you must take on these these things. And there was a lot that was that was complex um, that interested me in terms of character, um, character complexities. Um, my mother and her friends were, you know, they knew perfectly well that this was a movie that was very backward and racially bigoted. They were reading the progressive Chicago Defender, which was saying, don't go see this movie. And they went because as bright young college women, educated women, they wanted to participate in the mainstream, in the, in the high points, um, as it was seen, of white culture as well as black. They wanted, in a sense, to claim that privilege. And they were simultaneously pulling back, you know, and judging and thinking, okay, well, let me borrow Fiddle Dee Dee from Scarlett O'Hara. You know, let me do my own manners. Oh, uh, find my own ways to appropriate certain parts of this movie. You could, you know, you were, you have, they were proud that Hattie McDaniel got an Oscar, but they were ashamed that she played this role, Mammy. So I wanted to get all of these cultural and psychological um, contradictions that, you know, we tend to think we're, we're, we're handling life when it's just either or, or binary or duality. We are dealing with multiple complications all the time. Well, I, I think I think your your word is and rather than or. Yes, it's not. It, 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 we, it gone with the wind is all these terrible things, and there was much about it I enjoyed, even respected. You, well, now tell me what you respected about it. Do you mean no, as, no, as, I, as, I, as, I, as a technical creation? You. I was speaking for you. You were speaking for me? I, yes. I, when I, I'm not sure I would use respected, but that I was, I was gripped by. Gripped and that, by. Uh, yeah. And that does imply a certain, a certain kind of craft and canniness. Absolutely. It's a, it's a magnificent example of the classical Hollywood studio era style. Mm -hmm. it's beautiful filmmaking. Yeah. And yeah. it is what it is. And yes, exactly. Yeah. So there, here we are with all of it, because it's not, you and I have talked about this with Porgy and Bess. Yes. And I remember, yeah. you know, these, these big American, um, you know, mastodons, <laughs> um, 
they're really complicated. And whenever race is there, whoa, mixed motives, mixed intentions, um, you know, yeah. Um, and lots, yeah. But, but one can say Porky and Bess has these faults and yet it is extraordinarily powerful yeah. if you approach it in the right way and you can condemn it ideologically in certain other respects. Yes, so and both an of analogy. those are, li both, all of that's legitimate. Yeah. Of all of it's legitimate. But what I like about your book is its openness. You're not uh, pushing a hard line ideology. You're, you're, you're very open. You, there's a sense of uh, experiment. You're testing out ideas and you want us to go there with you. Thank and you're you. not coming to hard and fast conclusions, agree with me or else. That's not I, your position. No, that's true. And I'm also um, writing, I want to claim as much room and space um, in this culture. And I want you know, I want my readers to do that too. And the only way I can do that is to keep encountering. You know, I can denounce, that's fine here. I can embrace there, but I have to, you know, it, it, um, I want to be one of those upon whom um, nothing is lost. Even when it's hateful, I, you know, I, I want to take it on. In that way, someone like Josephine Baker is, is a wonderful model. <laughs> there was nothing. She, I'm afraid of plenty of things, but um, I wanted a certain liberty here to to claim to it only examine. Um, you know, anything I wanted. I didn't want anything. When when a culture can has the power to forbid you things, which a culture does in terms of race, class, gender. Um, one way to come back is to claim as many um, things, as many possibilities, as many ways of being and ways of seeing as you possibly can, um, you know, and to borrow from, learn from um, any and everything, and then do with it what you will. May I, may I ask this? this I, I, I'm hesitant to ask the question, but I want to. Mm -hmm. You, you, points in the book suggest that black people among other blacks are act in one way, but there's a certain performative element in dealing with white people. Is that, did I misread or is there, I, is there a sociological accuracy there? Um, I um, think, um, I, I don't think that I said across the board, but I no. think there are scenes that I draw where, um, you know, the black characters, including me, we are conf we are confined, confessing, not confining. Sorry, we are confessing um, certain things to each other, sharing certain experiences, memories that are private. Um, I don't feel that every um, black person has to perform in a fixed ritualized way with every white person. I don't think every white person has to do that with every black person, but that performative anxiety um, is very, very, um, you know, it is very tied to the racial dynamics of our history, don't you think? And I think it goes both ways. Um, I think it does I think go both ways. white and black people often find themselves in formal situations or encountering each other for the first time, behaving with great care and, and navigating certain expectations, we might say, or anxieties or stereotypes and, you know, trying to navigate those while also trying, you know, to be, to, to, to fix their gaze on the person actually in front of them. Um, race relations, um, is just that. It's a network of very um, often complicated and charged. Um. But you, you do uh, mention in the book, it's one of the most powerful sentences, that you were raised to have perfect manners, a wonderful education. You were raised not at any point to ever allow yourself to be somebody perceived as somebody who was offensive or giving offense. 
Um, and that's absolutely or less than less than admirable. That's true. Um, that is essentially how I was what how what I was taught. But everyday life goes on very very differently. You know, you play, you have a good time. You're, you know, um, a lot of how I grew up was lots of fun. But the there were these social and cultural expectations. You know, there's the intimate everyday stuff, there's the familial stuff, then there's the social and cultural um, and historical stuff. And that, in terms of this particular class I belong to, this, this um, Black haute bourgeoisie, um, our role had been defined for several centuries as you will embody, um, you know, all the best qualities of your own people. You will show that you can embody all the best qualities of white people. You are advancing the race. You are proving that you as a people are equal and sometimes superior. That's your role in history. Um, and that is, I was, I was taught that, but you know, I was also taught, I was also given um, a fun childhood. <laughs> oh. But you, I, you, I wouldn't even be able to, you know, cover the range of things I do if I hadn't been given that access to a range of pleasures. But you, you mentioned in the book that your, your family, you grew up in a very prosperous family. Your, your, your people are professional people. It was because both your grandmothers, maternal and paternal, were geared to overcome defeat. They were geared yeah, for victory. And, and prejudice and bigotry and confine. Yes, absolutely. They rose above all of that. They, they rose above fought it. against it. Yes, yes. And they were part of, of generation that, uh, you know, they, they both of them went north, you know, as part of the great migration, um, one to Los Angeles, one to St. Louis and then Chicago. Um, and they were part of that extraordinary generation that just kept pushing against and, um, um, barriers, yeah. You're, you end the book with a an imaginary encounter with a black grandmother. I'm yeah. assuming a one maternal of grandmother, yeah, maternal grandmother, yeah. who you realized uh, would tell you tenderly, with feeling, but firmly, you can't be tired yet. You haven't quite earned the right. To be tired, because, yet. which I translate, Margot, into when do we get the next book and what is it going <laughs> to be about? <laughs> That's very funny. We, this this book is so gorgeously written that we want a sequel and soon. Well, but thank you. I'm, I'm working at it. I'm not tired yet. I'm working on it. Okay. <laughs> you you have a you have a next project. Um, I'm the, I am. To, uh, I shouldn't say toying with, I'm working with and playing with, toying with, exploring a couple of possibilities, but I won't say anything more. Um, okay, um, but, but yeah. there'll be another book. There will there be, will be, absolutely, yes. Oh, good. And, and, and I also want to do a collection of a lot of the criticism I've worked on. Oh, good, before. good. Yeah. I look forward to that. And you're teaching still. I am. I'm not, so yeah, you see, I, <laughs> I'm so you, insisting that I'm not tired. That's right. Yes, yeah, so you can tell your grandmother, no need to worry. That's right. I'm not tired I'm living yet. up I'm to your highest uh, expectations. That's right. Okay. okay, wonderful to talk to you. I'm one of your biggest wonderful. fans. I look forward to the next book. Oh, and Linda, you. can we get some questions for Margot from our audience? Beautiful, beautiful interview. Um, you know, um, when I read your book, it reminds, um, Margot uses painting a lot, music, painting, art, to, to express who people are, yeah. the decisions they make, how they come to who they are as people. And I wanted to let you know that Reading it, it reminds me of looking at a Cubist painting of Picasso and Brock. Oh. In that, we see all facets, all planes, all hues of an image at the very same time 
and then search to make sense of it. I love that. Thank you. That's just, that's, that's terrific. That's the ideal nervous system. A cubist. <laughs> yes, yes. Could you go into that? Because one of the questions is, how did you come to your title? And your title, you know, that's how I saw it, the way a cubist painter would ask us to look at a moment. Yes, it's I, I, I loved the idea of the, the materials that um, are of us and in us and, and with us all the time, our sensations, our thoughts, our, our you know, reactions to our own histories, um, our uncertainties, that all of those could be, um, you know, with, with lots of effort, <laughs> um, assembled, reassembled, re arranged the way um, an assemblage is the way a work of art can be. Oh, I'm going to take. Oh, that I don't want that color anymore. I'm going <laughs> to wipe it out and start again. Or a piece of music. Mm, I'm going to transpose it to another key today. I loved the idea that, of course, it's a a dream vision in a sense, but that that's what one could, what um, a writer, an artist could keep doing with the, the materials of, of themselves and of their craft. Yes, and this inspired me. I've never read a book that asks that of me, of anybody reading it. And the other, one of the other um, words you use, verbs you use, conscious and unconscious. And you, you know, there is a saying that the pains of life become the joys of art. Mm. Do you think that the women you write about, Ella Fitzgerald, Josephine Baker, even Sammy Davis Jr., yes. at some point consciously molded themselves into the works of art they became or just live themselves unconsciously and we, their public, turn them into the works of art they became for us. Uh, I think I think it's I think it's both. I think all of these artists that you named, and I would say most, well, let's just talk about they the the, the combination of of the kinetic, the unconscious, and the utter consciousness that goes into crafting your art, crafting, if you are a performer, the personas, the selves, um, even if it's Ella Fitzgerald's absolute modesty, playing with and against this absolute virtuosity. She understood that. Yeah, you know, we bring as um, and she and she perpetuated that and used it. Josephine Baker used this multiplicity of styles and selves. They they do it. They can't guarantee how it will affect us. You know, <laughs> they know we'll bring material that um, that that's our own that they may not want, but they know what they know what they're doing. Um, they and do. then, and if they're generous, the most generous artists give us license don't you think, to bring back and to project, if you will, what we want? Yes, very much so. So this book for me is, is a challenge. Um, um, no one in my life has ever asked me to see myself or consider myself a work of art. And one in yet, constant progress and process, right? Right. And yet your book stimulated me to consider it. So I was wondering when you were writing this, were you asking us, was there an intention that you were asking us like these extraordinary figures who are works of art, look at yourself in that way and use the tools of art to create yourself? I, I would say I like that. I would say I was being a little more... Um, a little more modest in that I would say, look at yourself as a work in progress, you know, uh, and you can be, um, you know, not necessarily will you ever be a finished work of art, but look at the, 
the examples, the versions, the, the, you know, the, the encounters with yourself um, as art uh, and as a lover of art, um, which also helps us transform ourselves, simply, simply loving it. So I, I love the idea of, of, as you say, being a work of art, um, but we can't stay fixed as long as we're alive. So no. it's, a, it's a mobile work of art, or it's also with ourselves, we respond the way we do over the years to works of art. Oh, I used, I loved, you know, that book when I was a child. No, I, I don't so much anymore. Oh my God, I've just reread, I never could understand this writer and now I'm beside myself, you know? And it's, it's that kind of progression and improvisation as well as we, we improvise as we go along through life, but we also compose ourselves, don't we? We do both. Yes, uh, uh, Alan Cumming in his interview with us a few months ago said he learned acting through improvisation and now he has learned to live his life through improvisation. Oh, that's interesting, yeah. Um, I could do you start. do that? Do you do that? Not as much as Alan Cummings, I suspect. <laughs> does. I, well, I, someone, I aspire to do. You it. aspire, <laughs> yes. Right. Someone has asked, do you? Um, how did you choose the title of your memoir? Well, actually, the the title came from a conversation with a writer friend. Um, a woman named Wendy Walters, who's an essayist and a poet. And we were, I was in the midst of grappling with the book one Christmas um, and we were having dinner and I said, oh, I was sulking. I said, oh, Wendy, it's so hard. And she said, well, yes, it is. And I said, well, I know why it's hard. Why? You tell me. I mean, I needed some sort of, she said, because it's like constructing a nervous system. Oh. oh my God. And then I, I took it and I started working with it. It, it gave me some sense of, of, of progress and ambition and, and aim. And I just thought this is so interesting. So, you know, you, you so, get inspiration from a friend that then let me turn it into what I, what I needed it to be. And then how did you go about doing it since it was a first time a new way of approaching the experience. I Could did you... it very much bits and very much bits and pieces, which is tends to be my way. Even if I'm doing a review, I will start with a quote that interests me. Then I will um, put a chunk of research there. Then um, some associative, you know, um, intellectual or emotional line will go. Um, I start. I, I at the same time. I, I would make lists um, of the of the artists who kept coming back to me and staying with me. And that would give me, you know, grounding. You know, you, the, you need to find your way through um, and to and through these people. But the, um, and then I would use each of those. Then I would compile certain sense memories that um, oh. attach themselves to different artists. Um, or not always artists, um, you know, like like athletes, um, women athletes, and then then but then that would lead me, and then sometimes the autobiographical um, would help. The thinking about women artists, about women, sorry, athletes would lead me to women ballet dancers, and then that was a way of thinking about craft and art and gender and and race. So I just kept compiling the autobiographical. The, um, the artistic um, and my associative links. And so well, I think it just happened and you're lucky, you know? Um, I was writing about, I wanted to write something about um, James Baldwin, um, but I didn't want to repeat myself. And I sent away for an interview um, in an old Playboy magazine. And there was <laughs> also an interview when it arrived, I paid considerably for it, um, with Sammy Davis Jr. Uh, I love that. I saw the two of them as these child stars who had become these, you know, um, prodigies of, of art, of skill, of race. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, that has inspired me. That's what I'm coming away with.
I'm so glad. From your, from your book, uh, I mean, no one has ever, I've never read anything like this. It's new and a new way of approaching my life. So I want to thank you. And it's uh, five o'clock and um, we must end this session. But I think you have given us so many tools for which we can work to create a more exciting, expressive, and artistic life in the framework of the world we live in. The world today. we've been given. That's right. That's yes. Right. <laughs> Thank you so much. Foster has disappeared from my screen, um, but I loved our conversation. So I thank you, Foster. Linda, thank you. Um, all of you who are in the audience who came today, whom I cannot see, but you know, the 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 invisible presences in darkness. That's 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 haunting. Yes. And don't forget to look in the chat box for where you can write away for Margot's book, a signed copy of oh, her yes. book. All right. Thank you. Thank and have a you. beautiful was, weekend, Margo. Beautiful. This was a pure pleasure. A pure pleasure for us. <laughs> and thank you, Foster, wherever you are. Wherever you are. <laughs> That's right. Bye-bye. <laughs>